This is the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Tickers. My guest today is Anna Leffler, a humor author whose comic novel Preschool comes out this fall. She also wrote The Chictionary, From A-Line to Z-Snap, The Words Every Woman Should Know. She was recently a staff writer and sometime performer for the Nickelodeon Nick Mom TV show Parental Discretion with Stephanie Wilder Taylor. She launched her humor writing career by starting a mommy blog. A lot of people have blogs. Yeah. How do you do a blog that actually gets a response and that gets people to find you and publishers writing to you? Because a lot of people are like, how does, how does that happen? Exactly. You've been doing it a while, right? Is that the main thing or what? do you have I've, other secrets? I, <laughs> um, I've been doing the blog, I guess, two and a half years or so. That's not long. It's not very there long. There were probably a billion blogs when you started. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so you have some kind of magic ingredient. <laughs> well, that's very nice to say. I, um, I don't know if there's a lot of surreal humor out there the stuff that i put on my blog is nutty it's 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 how my mind works Uh um and it's it's somewhat surreal and it's a little bit twisted um but it's clean because i i hold myself to what i call the bob newhart standard which is if it's not broadcast quality i mean if you can't be funny within those bounds i don't i think you need to try harder that's just me i mean i I grew up on that stuff i grew up on carol burnett and bob newhart and steve martin and they didn't lean on that, so I don't. You know, plus I have kids, so I figure I want my kids to be able to read my blog. That's great. And um, I'm, you know, I'm kind of an uptight white girl, so that stuff doesn't. Right. I, you know, I can't really do that authentically anyway. Right. It's not. It's not comfortable it's for not you to go thing. there for laughs. Exactly. I'm. I'm cu- very curious to know more about those influences that you mentioned, but just a little more about the blog. Yeah. So, had you done some humor writing before the blog? Not. Officially, no. I had done, okay. uh, before the blog, I had done some stand-up. I did a couple years of stand-up in yeah. L.A., which, which really, I mean, most of my real early working years, I was a crisis communications consultant. I mean, I'm a, I'm a corporate animal, and okay. that's, I grew up in that kind of mindset. I always thought that's what I would do. It's kind of what you did. You carried yeah. a briefcase if you had a real job. And, uh, and I did that for ages. And then when I became a full-time mom, um, I suddenly my day was kind of blown open and I didn't have a nine to five routine anymore. Um, and that's when I started experimenting with writing because it's something I'd always wanted to do. Wait a minute, I'm confused. I'm sorry. Because I have a kid. <laughs> How are you not chasing kids all day? How are you writing? Well, I'm, I turned myself into an early bird, which helped. I used to you I, get a couple hours in the I morning. I still get up really out. early. Yeah, okay. that helps. How and, early? Um, I'm up at five every day. Okay. Um, I think I broke myself because I don't think I can turn that off now. It's it's just I've ruined my biological whatever that clock is that runs right, yeah. you. Yeah, I feel like everybody has a rhythm, but you can change it if you just like yeah. stick to a new schedule for like six months. Yeah, then you're you're fixed. Then you're locked in. You can in. basically make yourself whatever. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Um, so, so you ro- you you were incredibly productive for an hour or two in the morning. Every morning. And then I would fit it in wherever I could. Um, my, my kids were good about taking some pretty epic naps, and I would always take, you know, I really, ju- the minute they were both asleep, I'd be at my desk. because you got, you got them both <laughs> to sleep at the same time, it sounds like. Sometimes. Sometimes. How, how, what's the age difference? Uh, 17 months. Okay. Yeah. But to answer your question about the blog, I, I, the comments that I would get back um, First of all, I don't think many women were writing surreal stuff. I think uh, the the peers, the, the blogs that I would go to and really enjoy um, would typically be, I, I'm going to get slaughtered for saying this, but but there weren't a lot of women writing this kind of stuff, uh-huh. you know, um, because I wasn't writing about being a mom. I was writing about... Um, like a surreal piece about what if I gave my husband a sport kilt for Christmas? You know, how would that go over? Because right. it's weird stuff. <clears throat> other women writing about being a mom and not writing surreal? Oh, there's, yeah, there's huge, huge, mom huge blog, yeah, mom blog movement. And a lot of them are extremely funny, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to write about my daily life. I wanted to, or if I did, I wanted to twist it and make it really bizarre um, I never used my children's names. I mean, my family names on the blog are my husband is John Bon Jovi, <laughs> and my kids are Marticia and Gomez, because it's just weird. I mean, that's kind of the world that I like to live in mentally, um, weird. So no publicity, just you put out the content. Yeah. Um, did you meet people like through your previous stand-up career that 
you sort of said, hey, check out my blog? Did you email people? Did you do any out, kind of outreach at all? You know, no, because the stand-up, the, I didn't know anybody in stand-up who was doing that. I was, in the, in the stand-up crowd that I was in, I was by far the most writerly. What I loved mm. was the writing of it, um, the getting up and performing of it. I would do, but I had to get really psyched up for it. I'm not a real, hey, look at me kind of person. Um, I liked the writing and the crafting of it. And I think that kind of led directly into the blogging part. There were a couple of, I don't even know what the right word for this is, but groups of bloggers who would be very mutually supportive. And there were a couple of those where I would post something and a couple people would notice it and it would start to mushroom. And people go, oh, wee, wee, wee. And I'd tell my traffic suddenly really jump up and my followers really jump if, uh, if you'd put something up that was truly funny where they, I think stuff that's really funny, people notice. And they, they send it and send it and send it. And you get these little stampedes, you know, every now and then of people. Um, because I don't, it's very rare that I read something on the web that's not put out at a professional level, you know, on a professional humor site that really busts me up. And I think if people have that reaction, they send it around yep. and you start to get these little waves. And I think that's what happened. Cause I didn't, I didn't put any resources into it. That's for sure. Well, I mean, <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> it's good to know when the internet was new, that was the case then. Mm -hmm. But I figured now with like 8 billion websites that even if something really great were put out that it would just be a drop in the ocean. So it's kind of a comfort to know that yeah. in just the last three years you've experienced, like you put up a new blog, you don't tell a soul, basically. Yeah. And uh, you yeah. put up some funny stuff and people do find it. I think they do eventually find it. And there's there's kind of a, a citizenship type thing too. I make a point of, um, I try to be a good blog citizen. If people, you know, I've met people whose children are, are suffering from unusual ailments and they're out there and they're trying to raise awareness for it, get sponsored in their jogathons and those kinds of things. And um, I support that stuff. You give. I do give. I, I think that's a big part of it because it's a very human community, even though it's electronic. Um, and people Wait, it's not just all that. robots? I know. It's people. <laughs> some of them are robots. All right. <laughs> but some I think of, some of them are of robots. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> some of those weird articles you'll find that are like marketing, you know, articles know. that have a certain number of search words per mm -hmm. word. It's, yeah. Robots, or you find your stuff on some aggregate site and you get there and it's like, well, that's my title and that's my opening paragraph, but I have no idea how that got there. And that's, yeah. Yeah. No, it was put robots. together by a robot. So since you were more interested in writing than performing, let's go back before the performers you mentioned. What were some early writers that you really liked that really sort of lit your fire as a young person? You know, I, um, my very favorite book... One of my very favorite books growing up was Harriet the Spy. And I would read it almost every year. I just loved it. I loved that it, in hindsight now, I see that it was really a grown-up novel that happened to have a child as the protagonist. And I think that's why it resonated so much. I loved it. It was complex and emotional and subtle. And I really, really loved it. Um, and I, you know, I read all the, you know, I read, the Borrowers and, you know, all those cute little series, all the Paddington books when I was younger and pretty traditional, you know. Um, every now and then I would pull a grown-up book off the shelf. You know, I went through my Tolkien phase. Everybody goes through their Tolkien phase. Um, but and then as I got a little bit older, um, I, I really sought out books that were funny but intelligent, which is hard to find. It's hard to find yes. something that's you know, it doesn't kind of poke you in the eye and think it's funny. It's something that's a little more, a little more complex. And then I, you know, as I got older, I, I think my high watermark is a Confederacy of Dunces. I read that also about once a year. Oh, do you? And it blows yeah. me away every time. It's just so brilliant and intimidating. But yeah, it's such a tour de force of yeah. um, creative ideas. Yeah. Just like it's just a stream of them that's almost. Yeah, uh, I never finish like reading you said, it. Like really. intimidating. <laughs> it is intimidating, and I'm and I'm from New Orleans, so it has. I have a soft spot, even though I didn't live there for very long. There's that little, that little uh, overlapping circle. You there. can picture this the location probably. Yeah, it's a really quirky place, and yeah. and uh, I just thought it was brilliant. <laughs> Who else did you discover when you started looking for humor books? Um. I found. Uh, gosh, I'm so horrible with author names. There was, <laughs> there's a book that I've also read many times um, called 
happiness. And it's not the one that, there was a movie called Happiness that I guess makes you want to just kill yourself because it's so not happiness. It's not that. Um, it's irony. Exactly. Um, no, this is a book I stumbled across. I always find the best books just stumbling across mm. them. And it's written by um, a Canadian fellow whose name escapes me. Um, but the premise of it is this fellow works in publishing and he has a stack of uh, self-help book manuscripts on his desk. And what ends up happening is he publishes a self-help book that actually works. And the entire nation becomes happy and everything falls apart. It's hilarious. I mean, I'm not, I'm not selling it very well here, but um, it's brilliant. And there's a, there's a line at the beginning that um, I cracked the book open. I was kind of skimming through it. And it talked about how he lived on a street where the trees were occupied by chain-smoking squirrels. And I was like, I'm in if you've got chain-smoking <laughs> chain yeah. squirrels. It just killed me. I thought it was um, very funny. Who else? Did you, did you seek out any of the like, classic humor books um, or humor authors of the past? You know, probably, well, Irma Bombeck. I was okay. reading Irma Bombeck when I was 10 years old. I'm a huge Irma fan. And I think she's kind of this stealth fighter jet. You know, she gets in there and you don't really see her coming. And the stuff seems very kind of, you know, mellow and housewifey. But it, would, it just killed me. So I, I started reading that when I was little. Um, but I, I, would, I would usually seek out stories that felt real to me, but the person writing it obviously understood the farcical nature of life in general. I, that really appeals to me. Um, there's a woman who wrote a book called um, The Big Love, and again, it's not the TV show. It's, it was around before that. And I just thought it was hilarious. Her, her boyfriend had gone out to get more butter during a dinner party and, and decided then to leave her. So she's in this dinner party and he never comes back. And that's kind of the, that's the kickoff of the book. But the whole thing was, was, it just worked. I like characters that have foibles but aren't so crippled by them that it's just a complete chore to read the book. Um, I'm kind of all over the map on that. I, I, there are huge holes in my literary history. I completely admit that. But it sounds like you were inspired by other people whose work you liked that was funny almost tangentially. Like you seem to have this pull toward it. And, and I sense that you're like saying, well, I like this, I like this, I like this. But, but there wasn't really anything that was like that spoke to you and said, I must do this. That, that was something else. Like what right. do you think personally propels you in, to wanting to produce comic writing? I was always the class clown. I mean, I grew, I grew up in a funny family. I have an older brother who's extremely funny. And um, I, I, it's just always been something that I've done. And I've always um, really, really gotten huge personal satisfaction from cracking somebody up. I get a, I get a real joy from that. Um, but I was also, um, it would never have occurred to me to perform it. I mean, I think in hindsight now, I think I would have been on a different trajectory. I would have had a little more guts, maybe. Um, but I was kind of like the honor student who was always getting sent to the principal's office. So I, I enjoyed being good at writing, and I was, and it always came somewhat naturally to me. And I was good at grammar, and I was, you know, good like goody two shoes kind of student. Um, but I couldn't resist the the funny part of it, and so that's that ended up being a good mesh, and I was comfortable on the page, I think in a way that I've never gotten completely comfortable on stage. Um, again, probably because I started pretty late doing that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, I was always fascinated by the, the way you could evoke a physical reaction with a written word. I think that's always, if I read something that makes me laugh in real time, out loud, I'm always very impressed. Like, wow, that's hard to pull off. It's really hard to pull off. It blows me away, too. It rarely happens to yeah. me. But when it does, it's like, wow, that really was amazing. And it's a gift. If, if yeah. somebody tells you, oh, my gosh, I, I was reading your stuff on the subway this morning, and I laughed out loud, and people thought I was weird, that's a gift. That's a huge yeah. gift. So I think I've always been searching for that sweet spot, you know? Yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned school. I think a lot of um, people in comedy look back to their school, like later mm -hmm. schooling, as a really formative period. Right. Personally, I think it has a lot to do with the, um, the rigid disciplinary structure of 
public school. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you went to a public school. Yeah, or all the way through. Fancy school of some sort. No, public. public. <laughs> and this was this in New Orleans or? No, I um, I, I grew up in Houston and did okay. did two years in Virginia and the rest of the time in Southern California. So, okay, yeah. so you've been around. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are some schools like crazy smart people. You know, have these schools where the kids can do whatever they want or mm -hmm. they do like this unstructured play that goes on for three days and mm -hmm. the teachers encourage creativity but you know that's not most of our school experience no. where you know you're just supposed to sit there you know like an automaton and move when the bell tells you to move right. and certain people have a creative spirit that really does not is not suited to that in right. any way right and it's a rare person who can also achieve so i'm kind of intrigued that you were like you could sort of win at the system and get good <laughs> grades yeah. and still like you, you you did not like being confined by the system tell me more about your school years and like what it was like to be a funny person in school did you get like really frustrated by that were you having fun was it no big deal to go to the principal's office or was it, were you really angst ridden i no i had fun with it because uh um i definitely stayed within the system uh, there's a part of me that finds um like, like three days of extended shapeless play, I think I couldn't have handled that. I would be tidying up. I really would. I'd be like, okay, you guys, it's, shouldn't we kind of clean up a little bit before we play some more? And, you know, I should admit that, but that's, that's who I am. I mean, I've been known to kind of tidy up hotel rooms. I, I, think, I think the fact that I have that side of my personality makes it easier to write kind of demented stuff. I'm, my feet are on the ground in that respect, um, but plus I also, you know, no family is perfect and we had our ups and downs in our family. And I think, uh, those kinds of routines and things I found somewhat comforting, you know, okay. to kind of, you know, have my, my little, uh, backpack ready the night before for school the next day. I'm very much that girl, um, for better or for worse, it kind of drives some people crazy. Um, but the, this, I didn't mind being the cut up i figured uh you can only get in so much trouble when you're on the honor roll there's really only so much that because they're only going to come down on you so hard if you're getting really lousy grades and you're cutting up a lot you're a dead duck you know that's but a problem there's only so much they can do and like anna you know please stop you know quit quit finishing your work early and disturbing the other people. It's not nice, and, but I couldn't resist it. Did they play the, uh, you know, you're a role model because you do so well in school, the other kids are going to be p badly influenced? I got a little bit of that, and I got a lot on the report card of, um, you know, Anna disturbs the people around her. That was kind of the whole mantra of my uh -huh. entire schooling. Um, but I was too, I was really too, it would have bothered me a lot if my grades slipped. I'm very uptight that way. But that, I think that kind of work ethic, I th you know, I think you can apply that to creative endeavors. I've definitely had to up apply it to the books because uh, you know how it is. It's like you've got, they don't just write themselves. It's, it's a job. You have to get your coffee and do your work. I know a lot of comedians and comic writers, and it is a very rare person who has the skills that you just described. Like oh. most people <laughs> are incredibly deficient in those skills. Okay. They do not pack their backpack the night before <laughs> they go. They're living in a pile of old newspapers, you know. Oh my gosh. So you're a rare creature <laughs> that you have those skills. And a lot of those other people come to comedy sort of by, by the same route, you know, by, mm -hmm. because they're, you know, their world is a mess. They're trying to think of something that makes sense, you know, intellectually. Some, some of them, I think, right, are that right. way. It sounds like you're coming at comedy more because it's fun. Is that an accurate Doesn't assessment? Doesn't that sound weird? Well, it sounds like very <laughs> emotionally healthy. But, you know, I think a lot of comedians come at comedy from a very emotionally unhealthy place. Right. They need approval. They, they right. need to feel better about themselves, mm -hmm. you know, making other people laugh. Or um, they're just, they're artificially trying to inject some joy in an otherwise horribly sad life. Yeah. It doesn't seem like you're that person. I, that's probably accurate. I've never thought about it that way because I always think of myself as kind of an emotional cripple, but, but you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not an angry person for sure. Well, I what way are you crippled? Well, I think there's a certain amount of, uh, well, a massive amount of insecurity for sure. Um, As we all have. Well, yeah. I, mean, I don't think I that's mean, anything unusual, but yeah, do you think you have an unusual amount? 
Probably not. I mean, it's, you know, compared to some of the other people that I was doing stand up with, where you think, wow, they, they've, they've, they've got to work through some stuff. Yeah. And they're going to be working through it apparently during their seven minutes tonight, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, it's certainly not at that level. Um, I think for me, it's more, there's a, there's a certain amount of the, you know, please like me, please love me kind of thing. Sure. Um, which I, I guess falls under insecurity. I'm, I'm, I don't have this this raging drive. Uh, I don't. I don't feel like I've ever really gotten hassled by the man, you know, or any of that. <laughs> I, I don't feel like I'm getting up there to finally have a voice. I never. Yeah. I've never felt like I didn't have a voice. Um, it's more. Um, kind of like building model airplanes. It's like how detailed do you want it to be? How real do you want it to be? How far do you want it to fly? I look at it like, can I? Can, will this thing really fly? Can I can I build something that everyone's going to want to get onto and take a trip on? Um, I, I look at it more like that. Like, hmm. can I build a craft that actually is airworthy or seaworthy, and take people someplace that they really want to go? Um, I, I kind of live. My humor kind of lives in the little spaces in between regular things, mm-hmm. and and that's really where I'm comfortable. Um, None of it is super high concept or or angry or gritty. It's it's more. Um, I, I want it to resonate with as many people as I can. For everybody, even if it's a small laugh, I, I really like people to go. Oh yeah, I never thought about that, but yeah, that's funny when that happens in between these other regular things. So your home is observational humor. Yeah, that's definitely. where you like to be, and you do you do it in a in a. You point out these observations that most people may not have thought about mm-hmm. using like non sequitur humor, goofy humor, crazy humor. Yeah, or something almost, I'll inject some fantasy in there to try to have right. a really straight ahead conversation about something that doesn't exist, but we're all going to pretend it does yeah. exist. It's a very left brain approach to humor that you have. <laughs> it is. The, the whole idea of building a model airplane, <laughs> you know, you're like, your humor structure is very sound. You know, observational humor obviously is like the bedrock of most mm-hmm. stand-up comedy, for example. Sure. You know, and th- that you come at it with from such a um, planner's mind, like a very <laughs> methodical <laughs> approach. <laughs> and I'm interested, you know, about the insecurity aspect of it, be- that you went into stand-up comedy, which takes the most security. Like, you have to have unstoppable confidence to get up there and do that. Yeah. Was that a good experience for you, having done that? Do you wish you hadn't? Oh, you wish no. you had approached it differently? I'm gl- I'm really glad I did it. Um, I it was my version of bungee jumping. You know, people will go, I want to do something that really scares the guts out of me, um, and that was it. It was sound. It 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 was much more terrifying to me than jumping out of a plane. Although I will not be jumping out of a plane anytime soon. Um, so your first time, that's yeah. when that was the scariest, obviously. Yes. And how did it go? It went great, but I have to say it was a really warm room. Okay. It was a very warm. Well, room. It, was it was a love a fest. Smart of you to but, yeah. have your first experience. It was being a perfect first nice experience. Yes, it was. A, How it, did you get that crowd? Um, a lot of people knew that it was going to be the very first show, and there were a lot of firsts in this particular lineup, and so there were a lot of people there who usually wouldn't be in a club. They wouldn't be in a stand-up club. Um, they were out there to cheer for their friends, as opposed okay. to you know doing an open mic where you know beer bottles are sailing past your head. Um, so it was that, a warm it was room. A, it was a first timer. It's somehow different from open mic. Oh yeah. And they yeah. have that that distinction in L.A. So yeah, I was very fortunate. I just ended up in this this corral of people, and there was kind of a uh, an overlap of several first timer cheering sections, and um, and it was actually the longest set I ever did, and it ended up being gosh close to twelve minutes. Which, you know, for stand-up, for, for somebody who's not obviously a name, um, is a, a pretty hefty set. That's and a big, long time to be yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, I'm an over-preparer, which I'm sure is shocking based on what I've already said about my uptight <laughs> yeah, tendencies. Yeah, of course. So the memorization was, I mean, I think I could, I couldn't, but I was going to say, I think I could still do that set because oh, it's wow. so burned into my mind. And you had it all, you had your 12 minutes planned yeah. out. I had, uh, I, you didn't yeah. improvise. You didn't do crowd work. I did a little improvisation. I, I'm not good with crowd work. Okay. I'm really not. I know. Well, again, you're a planner. Not you know, a, I'm a planner. And uh, 
I can ad lib just fine, but um, I don't know. I didn't do it enough to the point where I was limber enough where I would ever kind of stroll out in the audience and start, you know, yeah. calling people hockey pucks and all that good Don Rickles stuff. Did it get successively easier? Did you come up with new material? Were you more comfortable improvising, or did you just stick with that set? I, I took that set and kind of started breaking it into nuggets, and I would I would rotate in a new nugget and try out something different. Did yeah. you take a course or talk to a stand-up comic before you did all this? Because you did I, it like exactly how you're supposed to do it. I did, I oh, really? Okay. Um... I did take, I took a little very uh, casual class. Okay. And the first thing that, um, just to kind of get my feet wet. I mean, I had done presentations, luckily, in my work life. And so the idea of getting up and talking to people was okay as long as I was totally prepared, right? Right, right. Um, so that part of it, the, the idea of being up on a, a raised platform, I didn't start the flop sweat yet, uh -huh. you know? But... Um, the preparation is kind of my security blanket. Um, it's a great security blanket. It is like, for There's me. almost nothing better. Yeah, I mean, for somebody that. who's wired like me, I need to know what I'm going to say. But you can somehow seem loose and like you're not just reciting that something was, you've memorized. That's a trick. That, yeah, that was the dream. Uh, yeah. I know there were times when I probably did seem a little stiff, especially the first show or two. Sure. Um, but once I start, what, what would crack me up is you would hear getting feedback from the audience, or not even feedback, just hearing what they were saying, and they didn't think you could hear what they were saying. I, I walked out oh, on stage at the, ah, oh, it would throw me sometimes. I walked out on the, on the stage at the, uh, at the comedy store, and there were these two um, gay men sitting in the front row, and I'm opening my mouth to start, and I heard one of them say, oh God, look at those earrings, and I was like, oh, I, I, it just completely wow. threw me. And that shows you what a big, tough exterior I have, right? I'm rich. Yeah. Give me a break. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, when I was getting to, you know, to out myself as a total over-preparer, I'd never done any work with a microphone, ever. And I went to the music store, I bought the stand, and I bought the mic. And I you bought practiced. The, I practiced because oh I wanted to be able to know what I was doing. <laughs> and mm. some of the um, some of the bits that I did um, required a lot of gestures. And so I had to kind of have in my mind, I didn't want to lose the flow by suddenly like, oh, wait, I need the mic stand. Oh, and how do I get this? And where does this go? And how do I? So I, I, I would practice with the mic yeah. to kind of get my, you know, I, I'm sounding like such a dork. I know that. The over-preparing. And the, I mean, I... I it's a judgment call to say over-preparing. The, <laughs> the preparing that you do, I've rarely encountered the level of preparation that you're talking about. It just sounds very mature and responsible and, and, and prudent. <laughs> All those things go hand in hand with comedy, right? Like prudent they're not, and they're not the things you hear about. <laughs> no, I know. When you when you talk I to comedy even, people, I shouldn't even admit any of that. It's so good though because the people who have succeeded at it. Yeah. are the people who've had just enough of that to keep them going. Yeah. The people who have none of that, you know, God help them. They're just floundering. Even if they're incredibly talented. Yeah. They not only are they floundering, but some of them just can't handle it. Right. You know, they can't handle the the success they might have. Right. Or they can't handle the failure, the rejection that they might experience. Yeah. So, it's all very interesting. So you then fr from your later performances when you started working in new material, testing mm -hmm. material, I mean, how many stand up experiences would you say you had? Oh gosh. I mean I only did it for a couple of years and it was kind of it was kind of peppered through there, maybe fifteen or twenty shows okay. altogether. I mean, and so by the end you you clearly had given yourself some confidence that you didn't have before by the end. Oh yeah. Because I figure if I can live through this, then I'll you know, my mantra now is no matter what I'm trying to do, it has to be easier than stand up. <laughs> I mean that really mm -hmm. I'm not even that's yeah. That is, because I've been, uh, I mean, on this book tour, I've, I've had experiences that I've never had before. I've never, I had never been on TV before. Now I've done that. Excellent. And I, you know, I'd be nervous ahead of time, but I tell myself, it has to be easier than stand-up. And it is. Yeah. yeah everything is. Um, TV definitely easier, because they usually prepare you, and you know the questions, and you're like, you can have set answers. It's well, if like, it's conversational, I'm good. And if something you goes know? wrong, you know, they're likely going to help you. There's like people up there, <laughs> the right. interviewer or whatever. <laughs> exactly. You're not like on your own, standing <laughs> exactly. there naked with a mic. You know? I know, I know. So. No, it definitely was a, it was a confidence builder, and uh, it, it added to my skill set. The whole reason I started doing stand-up is I had been, I had been pitching this novel. 
you know, all roads lead back to the comic novel. Okay. And um, I wanted to be able to say um, in my query letters to agents and publishers that I was a stand-up comic because then a lot of authors, I think, are probably, you know, shy and retiring. They're not, you know, you know, they're cloistered. They're writing. Um, yep. They're not used to being out of their shells very much. I, I'm generalizing, but I've been told that that is that's a pretty correct. much an accurate well, yeah. assessment of most writers. Yeah, <laughs> they're shy. And and these days, it's all about you know having a platform and and being able to get out there and sell your stuff. And I wanted to present the most turnkey package I could to a publisher. And I, and I figure, look, if they look at this and know that I can do stand-up and not die, then they'll know that I can talk at a group, I can go on tour, I can, yep. you know, I can market a book. More planning. So I that know, how I'm long, really ahead, how far ahead was that? That was like a three-year plan <laughs> to get comfortable at stand-up before you pitch your book. Well, you know what I it's think? Impressive. I think part of it was also I tricked myself because if I can keep something in a corporate context, I'm comfortable with it. So. Okay. If I had said, hey, I'm going to try to be a stand-up comedian, I would have terrified myself. But if I looked at it like, this is an item on my to-do list in preparation for selling a book, I snuck up on myself and literally found myself standing on stage with a mic in front of me going, aren't I supposed to be home packing lunches right now? That was the weirdest thing was, how do I get myself into these situations? But I loved it. I loved it. Humor is um, humor is is my religion. It's what I turn to for comfort. It's what I give people when they need comfort. It's 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 what I have to give, you know. And so I found the whole thing really, really enriching and also terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and so you gave it up because of the blog, or just because you felt like you had done it enough? I hit a point where. Um, one of, one of my character flaws is um, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. I have a hard time not taking something as far as I possibly can. And I got to a point where um, I was getting really good reaction from people and I was really enjoying what I was doing. But the shows that I was doing were, you know, 10 o'clock at night on a Wednesday on the Strip. And the people I'd really written the jokes for were home putting their kids to bed. Okay. You know, because, you know, you look out and it's an audience full of people in their 20s. And I'm not in my 20s. And um, it was going over well, but I, I wasn't reaching my peers, the ones who could really relate to my material. <clears throat> yeah, if you had been on The Tonight Show, that well, would Well, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. And, and people I was talking to were like, well, you need to get on TV. Yeah. And... I hit a crossroads because I thought, okay, wait a minute. Wh- what am I really doing here? What's my, what's my goal? And what's my life? And my life is um, I'm not going to go on the road. I'm not going to, you know, you need to go out and earn your stripes and go on tour yeah. and open for people. It's and a hard really, life. Yeah. And, you know, there are a few regrets that I have and that I, I didn't have the guts to do some of the stuff when I was 22. You still could. Well, you do it when the kids grow up. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <Go back> and- <laughs> But I hit a crossroads, and I thought, you know, I my children were still, I, I I can't be gone like that. Right. And and I, my my overall goal wasn't to get on TV or to try to be on a sitcom or anything. I, I just I think I got a little, I pulled back a little bit, and it was a tough decision because mm-hmm. I was really liking it. Um, but I threw it all back into the writing again. Yeah. So so now an author, especially of a humor book, yeah. has to be a performer. Um, yeah. The publisher expects it. You need to go out there and do any kind of publicity and book signing that they can right. hook you up for. And if if your book is big and you need to go on TV, they need to know you can handle that. Exactly. Um, are you getting a little bit of that taste of you know your enjoyment of stand up by going out and talking about your book? Yeah, I'm having a great time. I love it. I uh, it it's it's very funny. I realized that because uh, I've been doing I've been doing readings. I've been in several cities mm. in the in the U S. and um, some TV appearances and some radio, which I love. I've realized I love doing radio. Hmm. It's so fun. Um, but I realized that just the, just the little bit of stand-up that I did, I accidentally internalized the clock, the, the stand-up clock. So, um, you know, when you're up on stage and maybe 10 or 15 seconds have gone by and there hasn't been a laugh, it's like all the alarms start going off. Like, mm. I'm bombing, I'm bombing. <laughs> and I was doing a reading at Book Soup. And um, the book is funny. It's, you know, 
intended to, yeah, yeah, it's intended to make people laugh. So I'm up there and I'm reading some of the definitions from the book and um, I'm getting, you know, very kind of polite, you know, an occasional titter kind of a thing. And I, I, I did my whole thing and I signed and everything and I was standing in front of the store with a girlfriend afterwards who's from the entertainment business and I, I value her opinion. And I said, Had it, was it okay? Did I bomb? And she got the funniest look on her face and she said, I don't think you can bomb at a book signing. And I realized that I've internalized that, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my watch going, I'm not hearing a lot of laughter. And she said, they're politely listening to you talk. <laughs> and that was such a huge helpful thing because I realized, oh, it's not a stand-up gig, you know? Reading, you know, like we just talked about, people don't often laugh out loud when mm-hmm. they're reading. If you're just reading a book, your book wasn't written to be a stand-up act. It's like a different medium. Exactly. So different rules. And I guess one of the rules of book signing is it's not like a stand-up act. <laughs> it's not <laughs> a laugh fest. You just sit there and listen politely. Yeah. I had uh, to have that pointed out to me. That's funny. So that was a very helpful... Uh, I mean, I never thought about it, but it's totally true. Like, yeah. You shouldn't necessarily expect guffaws at no. book signing. No. No, or book it's, reading. it's hard to turn that muscle <laughs> off. It really yeah, is. Yeah. If you're, I mean, if, you know, if it was Schindler's List, I'd be like, I'm coming to read this. You guys just sit there and be cool. And it's cool. Yeah. But, you know, I'm so used to the funny yeah. that it was well, nice to let that go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, uh, I did a book once uh, with a co-author and we actually came up with like a comedy routine mm-hmm. that we would go out to bookstores and do whenever we would do a signing, we'd do this routine. Okay. And I think the people who showed up you know, the audiences were friendly, but I think they were confused. Like, why am I looking at a comedy routine right. when I came for a, a book signing, book reading? Right, okay, and, I'm you glad know, it's we, not just me. Yeah, no, no, it was like, audience expectations are everything, you know, mm-hmm. so they were just weren't expecting, like, a show. Right. They, wa- they wanted to sit there quietly with right. their reading glasses and, and listen to a, a book. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that was yeah, a revelation no, for me and a relief. Mm-hmm. It was actually yeah, it's relief. so much easier just read. You know, oh. I'll read you a book. <laughs> Come yeah, on. I do this all day. Yeah. I'm just so glad I didn't bomb. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> so now I want to talk to you a little bit about your process, like mm-hmm. as far as how you stru- structure jokes or how you come up with funny ideas, harnessing the wild and crazy imagination <laughs> of your right brain into channeling it into that methodical planner mm-hmm. mind that is the one that you clearly favor. Yeah, that is true. Um, Well, I'm somebody who has to be, uh, I have to be very solitary. I could never work with a writing partner because I would never get, I would just want to talk. I just talk the whole time and eat. Um, So I have to, um, I have to get into kind of, it doesn't have to be silent, but I have to kind of retreat into my head. a lot of the funniest stuff comes when I'm driving. If I'm stuck, I drive. I always drive. I love driving. And I come up with the best stuff when I'm just out. Um, do you have a little recorder? Or how do you I have a little phone? notepad. Notepad. I shouldn't do that. But you should I, not do I that. I know. I know. I will write things down. But you're down probably in a traffic jam most of length. the time in LA. So <laughs> if I'm really matter. stuck, I get up on the freeway because you, you, you have to get at least above 70 if you're really stuck. That's just me. Oh, um, okay. So I'll, re- I'll end up really That's far from home. The stimuli has to be changing in order to yeah, get some ideas. Yeah, and I will, I, I will have loud music during that because then oh, everything okay. just starts firing and everything gets kind of fluid. Hmm. Um, but I'll jot things down all day long. Um, and then I'm a little bit woo-woo. I mean, I'll, I'll admit it. I've got kind of a woo-woo side. That's a recent development. Um, Whatever works, right? Oh, yeah, that's what I think. It's you just, a little, you're coming little up embarrassing. With, uh, it's, it's so interesting, though, that you clearly have a method for <laughs> managing <laughs> how, how you magically come up with inspiration for ideas. So, one, you, so you go driving. I go driving. Um, you play loud music sometimes while driving. Yes. Um, and let me hear some of the woo-woo stuff. Well, the woo-woo stuff is I'm notorious for not asking for help. I've been that way my whole life. I hate asking anybody for help, which is lame. I should ask everybody for help. It's healthy to ask for help. And people are so nice. You know, they're always happy to help. Happy to help. But I I really, I'm not good at asking for help. And um, that's an overarching theme in my life, like on every level, you know, theologically and beyond. And and so I finally have gotten hit over the head enough uh, with the fact that if if you ask for help, if you make yourself open to receiving things, they come. And it's been reinforced enough now. So I will literally sit down at my desk, and I, 
I haven't told anybody this, all right? So I'll sit down at my desk when it's time to write, and I will literally say out loud, okay, I'm ready, and I'm open to anything that's coming my way. I'm, 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 thanks. Thanks in advance for all the help. So that's totally law of attraction stuff. Yeah, that you're using. I know. It's a cliche, but... You know, people use it. They, it works for them. It's... It may be just it may be just Jedi mind shit, and, no, I, and it's, that's it's cool. Like, yeah, you know? I think it's attitude stuff, getting yeah. your head in the right place and the right attitude to yeah. be receptive to what might happen. Yeah, and to spin it positively, I think that's a huge part of it. Like, how are you characterizing it? Right. And right. if you characterize it as positive, it's going to be positive. <laughs> you know? That's what I think. Yeah. That's what I think. Um, it all. Uh, I don't know where it all comes from, and and I'm I'm cool not knowing where it all comes but from. But it works for you. It works for me. I think because I'm a systems girl, obviously. Yep. You need a and system. that's that's part of my system is, <laughs> you know, it's like waving the checkered flag. Like okay, right. let's go. It's on, and and we're yep. doing this now, and the doors open. We've and got deadlines. We've got yeah. quotas to meet. Yeah. So they exactly. Kind of <laughs> it's stuff to do. You know, we got stuff right. to ship out. But the other thing is, um, I really like uh, Julia Cameron. That the artist way with the, um, you know, with the uh, morning pages and the, yeah. and the play dates for your mind yeah, sort exactly. of stuff. I know. Have you done a lot of that stuff? I did that stuff a long time ago. Right and at the beginning. Kind of, you know, got a lot of use out of it early, and so I didn't follow up on the later exactly. advice. But it's like powerful stuff. It's really powerful, powerful stuff. stuff. And when yeah. I first, first, first was considering the idea, I was kind of. Like I was in one corner of the room and the idea of writing a book was way over in the other corner of the room and we were kind of just staring at each other. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started doing The Artist's Way and I didn't even get all the way through it. It just kind of, it teed me up and yeah. boom, and I was off and, and I'm forever grateful for that because <laughs> it kind of unhooked some of the, you know, the little red wagon of stuff I'd been pulling along behind me. It's like, no, I'm not like that and I'm not, I'm not creative yeah. and I don't, I'm not one of those people with the magic beans. I carry a briefcase. I write press releases. Yeah. You know, I counsel clients on... <laughs> I mean, literally, I was that. Right, right, I was right. like, I really thought that I was... If you'd asked me 15 years ago, are you a creative person? Oh, no. I, wow. I work in an office. I, mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I really believe that. Mm. And, and that, that was just enough of a push, huh. um, that little thing. So one of the things that, that she... That I internalized was... Um, People have all these tricks for not sitting down and writing. Absolutely, I I, I think I've mastered. Most oh yeah. Of them. yeah, well me too. I mean everybody has doing them. the dishes. Oh yeah, cleaning the, the house keyboard. is really clean when I don't want to <laughs> yeah. do my yeah. But her thing is just show up at the page, and if you can just make yourself show up, something will happen, and that is absolutely true. And I rely on that. So if I'm feeling, you know, a little hinky about what I need to do, all I have to do is get myself to the computer and open a blank page, and if I make myself keep my butt in the chair long enough, suddenly I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And that, that knowledge is very comforting to me. I just have to get my butt in the chair, and I just had it the guts to open a fresh document, and something happens. It yeah. just happens. No, it is powerful stuff, and I totally hear what you're saying about how you just get a little bit of that, and you're off and running. Yeah, it's like exactly. You do, I can't even imagine what kind of super writing hero you would be if you actually went through that whole book. <laughs> Got past week and four. And did all the, ex <laughs> the uh, exercises that she recommends, because it's like the first exercise and a half, yeah. and you're like, suddenly you're, you've are you written 10 books. Exactly. <laughs> you know? it's, ama it's an amazing, it is amazing. thing. That I, it's shocking more people haven't pursued it. But it's pretty popular. I do hear it about it here popular. and there. But so huge pockets of people don't they you know well they they are still they still claim to be suffering from the same old problems like writer's right. block or oh i can never get around oh i could never write they don't have the confidence or whatever right. and just yeah just crack that book yeah exactly <laughs> you're set that's the, that's you're one set. of my favorite gifts to give is that book so yeah and it terrifies right. people They're like yeah oh. you know it's like getting up on stage i guess in your yeah. own personal private stage in front of your right. computer it's, some people ha have a harder time with that for some reason yeah absolutely um but then when it's you're system actually structuring a joke or a line or a mm -hmm. funny thing do you let's dig into the the real uh, macro level do you have a process for that or do you just let it flow out of your head into this raw form it comes out it comes out very raw i'll have a i'll have a a concept for something um and i will wordsmith the crap out of it i really do which I'm right sure when it, right when it first comes out. When it first comes out, I just want to get it out because I've I have that um, 
that horrible experience of you're kind of dancing around the edge of something funny and like when you've been sitting there for a while and things are really kind of fluid and you have several different concepts that are kind of melding into one another and you're desperately trying to keep your arms around all of them so you don't lose the subtlety of any of them and then you think for one second about what you need to get at the grocery store and it's gone I hate that so I try to get everything down as quickly as I can just just so I've got it just to memorialize it um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work a passage and, and work it and come at it from several different angles and think, okay, what, what's the funniest part of this? What's really making this funny? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get to a certain point where I think, okay, I need, to, I need to let that cook for a minute. I'll put it aside. And then when I pull it back out again, my thing is, how can I get this to the next level? What would... What would, what would a real comic do with this joke? That's the thing I do to myself. Is what, would, what would one of my heroes do that I would never think of doing to take this to the next level and, and come at it from an angle that makes it... It's like, how do we make it better? Should we flip it upside down? Should we kind of do a negative and everything that was black is now white, you know, and, and, and turn it inside out? Um, and that part is where I really start to feel challenged because it's like, well... Is, is it as good as I could have made it? What would, uh, you know, what would so-and-so have done with this? Hmm. Um, and I try to push it and make it different and different because um, I want to keep growing. I want to I keep getting better at, no matter what I'm doing. And so I'm always kind of holding myself up to these yardsticks. Interesting. And it's funny that you, you play that trick, like what would a real comedian do with this? <laughs> and I, I, I do that trick sometimes. Really? Okay. Yeah, and I think a lot of people do. But somehow, I don't know, by some magic, it still comes out in your voice. Like it's still, you know, yeah. it looks like you and it has your vibe, you know? Yeah, I don't um, think I can that turn odd? that off. I know. <laughs> but it's like what, you know, you're favoring something. So yeah, I you're, guess so. you're picking it. Do you find any commonalities with the sort of subtextual elements that you come up with, like the core things that are funny? In other words, is there a certain family of things that you find funny that that is pretty narrow, or does it kind of run the gamut for you? Subject matter-wise, it's pretty broad, I would say. I, I tend to, the voice that you're talking about, oh, there's always a, um, there's always an element of being clueless that bubbles up through that voice. There's, there may be a, um, a massive misunderstanding. Um, like I was, I was writing the definition of Capri pants for the Chictionary, and in that definition, I said, you know, of course, there is no real place called Capri, but if there were, it would be like this. And, and the editor actually caught it, and I, I had got this big note back in brackets that said, you know, there is a place called Capri, and it's an island, and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, wow, how bad am I at this that she didn't realize I was kidding, or what's wrong with this person? So yeah. I, I, kind of, I went for the second one on that. Um, but th that tends to, that's a definite repeating theme in my work is that the person, the voice of it will either sound like they're very authoritative and faux, you know, stentorian. And then you'll find out that they kind of don't understand how much of anything works, but they're really talking like they know what's going on. Yeah. I have no idea where that comes from. There's a, when I have that particular hat on, that's the voice. And I don't know where it came from. I don't know who it is. <clears throat> well, but I'll tell you who it is. That's what people recognize. It is, um, <laughs> it is one of the classic comedic characters of the braggart Captain Fool. There you go. Who um, pretends to be a know-it-all. It's like very authoritarian, but they spout nonsense and they actually don't that's know what me. they're talking about. It's what the onion is. I'm the braggart um, hostess fool. And it's my favorite kind of character, <laughs> personally. It's fun. Remember Ted Knight from uh, Mary oh, Tyler Moore? I love Ted Knight. So did I. He was oh. exactly, he was like almost the textbook example of that because he was a news anchor. Fantastic. So he had to go on the camera and say, I am very serious. <laughs> but he was an idiot. He was know? an idiot, exactly. And there's, I don't know why that's so funny. I, think, I don't know either. Uh, to me, it's funny because of authority, I think, because mm -hmm. it's, it's our chance to poke holes in authority. Yeah. And it's clear that you have some issues with that as well, given your school experience. <laughs> so maybe that's why it's funny to you too. I don't it know. It is funny to me. But I think it's interesting that... Every single person you just named is a man. I don't think you find the braggart fool in it's, women very often. Well, let's talk about women in comedy, because being a woman, being <laughs> yeah. in comedy, you know it's an issue, that there aren't a lot of them, and that um, there are more now, yeah. a lot more now. Oh, yeah. Um, but I think that's been a real effort to, like, let's get more women in comedy. 
What's your thought on that whole issue? You know, again, I'm going to get slaughtered for this. By, I, <laughs> by whom? <laughs> by, I'm not sure, but they're out okay. there. Right. Um, I don't think of myself as a woman comic, and I don't think of myself as a woman writer. I'm, I think of myself as just a person, first and foremost, and I always have. It's the best women comics do, uh, Yeah, I just, I'm just me. Yeah. And I never, when I interview for a job, I never think, oh, are they going to hire a woman? I think they're mm. going to hire me. And I got to tell you, I, I wasn't trained to do that. That's just, that's just how I, you know, was hatched. And um, I, think, I think it helps. You know, I'm no, I'm no expert on this, but I think it helps if, because that's contagious. If I go into, um, I was always easy to work with because I wasn't the girl in the room. I was just Anna. And I think everybody unclenches when you don't come in guns blazing with, well, you know, you better respect me for, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, that's just, like I said, they're going to kill me. But uh, that's been my experience. I think everybody relaxes and can see what you do if you don't need to have that front and center. I just do my thing. And I've always done that. Um, I never... I never make a point of going, oh, you know, I want to make sure and read a female author. Or I want to make sure and watch a female sitcom or whatever. If you're good, you're good. If you're not, you, you know, you're not. And I don't see it. I really don't see it. I mean, my, my hero, you know, my heroes are very mixed, but that's not intentional. I don't think, well, I should like Carol Burnett because, you know, she's a woman and she's a groundbreaker. No, she's just awesome and that's yeah. you know so i don't see that and i know there's been a lot of uh there's a lot of talk about oh people don't think women are funny you know what if you're really funny people are going to think you're funny i really believe that i i honestly believe that if you can if you kill you kill and i think people don't care you know i I don't go see a, a comic because it's a, a, if it's an all-female lineup, I always think, why are they doing that? Why do they need to do that? Let's, get, let's make it an all-good lineup, and everybody, it, it's meritocracy. It, and for me, that's just me. I think it's a very a like healthy, that. very enlightened attitude. What the, to what, then, do you attribute the fact that there are far fewer women in comedy? I don't know. I, I, I've, I've, I have wondered about that. I do think... Um, I, th I think it's just catching up. I think 50 years ago, obviously, you know. Um, I think within the last 20 years, I think everything is evening out. Yeah, old traditions do. die hard, but once there's some momentum, yeah, it seems like, you know, a young girl coming up now who's interested in comedy would in no way look at the comedy mm -hmm. industry and say, ooh, that's not really a place for a woman. No. I don't think they would say that. I don't think they today. would either. I don't think so they would either. So it's definitely the snowball has gotten big enough now. Yeah. And I, I think I think there's uh, I think the internet has helped that a lot because people can have massive readerships um, if they hook into the right networks and a lot of those networks are going to be networks of female bloggers and they're very supportive. Um, I, you know I don't even want to say that it, that it lends itself naturally to one gender or another. You know, getting up there can be brutal. And you could make the argument that, well, I mean, men are more suited to dealing with that brutality than, than women are. Probably, on average, that's probably true. Um, but I don't think that matters much anymore. I think if you really want to do it and you're funny, I think if you're really funny, you're going to make it, no matter, you know, no matter what kind of underwear you're wearing. I think if yeah. you're really funny, you're going to push through and make it. And for a while, it helped if you were a woman because... So many people wanted more women on their writing staffs or right. maybe they wanted more women in their lineup or whatever. And I don't know that anyone ever said, oh, she's a woman, even though she's not that funny, we'll put her on. <laughs> put her on. Right. Who can afford to do that? <clears throat> yeah. I think, yeah, I definitely, I think you're right. I definitely think you're right. I mean, that, that's my, that's my candid view on it. And I've gotten some pushback for that because people are like, well, you, you, you know, you should be more supportive and you should... Right. I don't, I don't think the team thing works. I don't think a team approach to it works i think you need to be good you know if i if i if i see a woman bomb i think i don't think wow you know that's too bad because that's one of the sisters you know going down in flames i don't look at it uh, that way it's like i and i think it's kind of uncool to look at it that way 
Because if you, if you laid the same thing over onto uh, different ethnic groups, you would sound a little stilted. It would sound a little odd to say, well, it sounds like you're looking down on that group, going, well, we yeah. need to give them a hand up. Right, no, right. They, everybody's, everybody's good to their own abilities, and it should, it should be based on whether you kill or not. I think there was a, um, some sort of comedy awards show. I don't follow these things, but there, there was a separate category for women comedians. And what I is thought, that? What? Yeah. Why? Why? What is that? Exactly. That's, odd. That's totally odd. And it feels like, uh, you know, like a student program to make sure that you get enough scholarship kids yeah. into this. I mean, I mean, you know, and it's a thorny issue, obviously. Yeah. It's like a second class citizenry right. trying to be a first class citizenry. There has to be a very awkward period of social help and yeah. affirmative action and things like that for, for people who. You know, there, there are always these, like, early adapters who, you know, really break through the bounds and are mm -hmm. just, like, an anomaly, like a Joan Rivers, for example. Yeah, I was know, just thinking of her. Comes up in, a, in an era when there were maybe one or two other, you know, right. women doing that. And I think she did it exactly the way you're talking about. She was just funny. She, yeah. she wasn't a funny woman or a, a comedian. Right. right, They even have a separate word for I it. I know. I don't have to um, know that word. <laughs> and, you know, if you look at any, you look at blacks, you look at Latino, you know, any minority group. Mm -hmm. that tries to break into a comedy, for some reason, comedy is kind of a touchstone thing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's because when you're up there on stage, it's about you as a person. It's like, yeah. who are you? You know, right. and observational humor is all about, can you relate to that person's experience? You know, right. so you still see, I see black comedians go on like uh, uh, Jimmy Walker mm -hmm. will go up and do the most categorically offensive <laughs> act if, if he were if he were not black, like mm -hmm. just the things he talks about, you know, every kind of black stereotype, you right. know, we eat watermelon, you know, we yeah. fried chicken, but none of that, we're, we're lazy. Like he'll do all of these like, <laughs> oh my God, ancient black stereotypes and he's getting laughs. Yeah. I guess that says more about the audience that they, they <laughs> accept that. Oh, but yeah. I think a lot of minorities in comedy have felt like, well, I have to go there because that's who I am. I'm up here. I'm a woman, let's say. The mm -hmm. audience knows I'm a woman. I better talk about being a woman mm -hmm. because that's what they can relate to. It's like the first thing you're going to want to do is come up with your persona. Right. And what's the funny thing I can talk about? Well, I'm really fat, so I should do the fat guy right. routine or the fat jokes or whatever. And so they air all those stereotypes so that people can take a breath like, yeah. oh, good, you know, he said blacks are lazy. That, that way I don't have to think. <laughs> right. you know? And I do feel like women had been in that boat. And I don't think they are anymore. Right. Um, but they, the, I remember that in the 80s. That was like a, what a lot of like oh, women yeah. coming up in comedy was. Yeah. When did you do your stand-up stint? When was that? When was that? Uh, I think 2008, 2009. Oh, so that was pretty recently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah it wasn't that long ago. That's the kind of trouble that watching The Secret gets a person into. <laughs> <laughs> so you watched it. That's so funny. I, watched I know. It just out. caused all kinds um, of problems. Okay. The Secret. Self-help. Are you naturally this together as a planner and as a goal achiever? Or did you get some help? Did you, you know, listen to Tony Robbins? Or did you do any of that other stuff besides <laughs> watch The Secret? <laughs> you know, I've always been... Um, I've always been a very, very type A person. That's, that was there forever. Um, you know, it always mattered to me to get good grades. It mattered to me to turn my stuff in on time. I'm kind of a dork that, that, like that. And I always have been and I always will be. Um, but what, what the woo-woo stuff did was um, open a door into trying things that I'd never had the courage to try. Uh, the, the work ethic was already in place, but what I was using it to do was completely unsatisfying to me because I, I worked really hard at my job, but I didn't like what I did for a living. And I did it for too long um, because I wasn't sure what else I was supposed to do. And I thought I was one of these people who didn't have the magic beans like you either you either have the beans or you don't and i thought well you know i'm 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 funny in you know the the break room but you know, that's that's about it and um things like the secret or the artist way they kind of burst this big balloon of that's not who i can't do that stuff F officially i can do it unofficially but unofficially 
And that was a huge gift because it really, it allowed me to kind of sneak out this little side door and rather than go through the huge stone gates that were really scary, I kind of snuck around the side by tricking myself. Oh, it's just a little exercise. Oh, I'm just going to write a little essay. And, um, and the whole idea of uh, whatever's going on in your head is what's going to be going on in your life. That was a revelation to me. I'd never heard that idea that that was and I'm probably pretty naive I was very kind of hermetically sealed as far as belief systems but the notion that anything you've anything you've got going on in your head you can actually make happen in your life that just blew me away and that caused all of this other stuff that started this whole like unraveling a sweater wow of all the creative stuff so I'm very thankful for that well thanks so much for talking with me thank you for having me uh, it was it's a, a pleasure Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. There's a lot more comedy resources, and you can get them by just going to howtowritefunny.com.